Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm your host and founder of Prep Athletics, Corey Heights. And on today's episode, we have a very special guest, John Mahoney. John is a coach. He's a former assistant uh, in the college level at such schools as Mount Aloysius, Robert Morris, Duquesne, West Virginia University, Michigan, and St. Francis of Pennsylvania. Uh, he was the head coach of the postgrad team at IMG Academy before founding 212 Academy. So, John, welcome to the podcast. Corey, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be on your podcast. This is a great deal of us, so we're excited. Yeah. Well, hey, tell me a little bit uh, about where you grew up and of all the sports out there, why you chose basketball. Well, I grew up in a small town outside of Pittsburgh uh, called Burgettstown. Uh, and uh, it was in my family ever since I was little. My brothers uh, played uh, basketball. My dad was an athletic director. So from a very small age, I was you know, involved in it. It was the mascot in the, uh, you know, elementary school. So always around the game of it. So just fell in love with it at an early age. Nice. And then what eventually got you into coaching? Uh, injuries and not good enough. So it was both. I got hurt uh, my senior year uh, at the end and then just started helping uh, on the sidelines and being involved and talking to kids and all that. So I found out I was a better uh could be a better coach than, uh, than I was a player. Uh, I didn't do the traditional, I didn't go to school right out of college, right out of high school. I got a job at US Air and at the time, it was a summer job and it just evolved into something more. And I was gonna go to school on the side and I didn't. So it took me longer to get my degree, uh, you know, to do that. But uh, I was, you know, Matt Driscoll, right? Sure. Matt Driscoll was the head coach in North Florida. He and I were the youngest head coaches in North, Western Pennsylvania one time. And uh, so I got started as a head coach uh, in high school at a young age. Gotcha. And what did you do at US Air? Uh, customer service. Okay. Oh, you're the person that had to deal with irate uh, passengers? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, sometimes. So give us a tip out there. Parents, if, you're if used our, to that. What's that? You're used to that with parents now. So you just, you you learned. So you learn from that situation to, to help with parents. Now, what? give me some tips. If my flight's been delayed or something, is the best thing to go in hot and angry or to be gentle and cool no, and calm? No, don't go in hot and angry. There's a point you have to build up to it. Like my wife, I was guiding her on it today. <laughs> you got to get something out of this, uh, you know, this dilemma that this is not, you know, they put you in an un unforeseen circumstance and put you uh, and the rest of the passengers in, in, a, in a, you know, in a situation that they, they didn't cause. It's not the weather. The weather, you can't do nothing. They can't do nothing. But once it's something that they can control and they can control what they what happens. So she did. She got a voucher out of it. So I'm happy. Oh, good for her. Good for her. Um, we just mentioned your your resume of all the places you've been. And you've been to some pretty, pretty big time programs there. Um, you know, Robert Morris, Duquesne, West Virginia, Michigan, St. Francis. Like, I'm sure you learned a lot at each of those programs. Can you give me just some tidbits you've learned from being in the D1 atmosphere that, that actually helps you nowadays as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? I want to just take one step back further from that to my high school, um, Our Lady of Sacred Heart, because I, I, I found out that I, I can build things. And that's what I did. When I got there, at, at, uh, they called Osh, uh, but they, they didn't have a program. And I mean a program from culture to, you know, everything in, involved. So a long story short, I had 12 kids when I started. I had kids dressing JV and starting JV and varsity to 10 years after that, winning three uh, conference championships, uh, having 35 kids, two freshman teams, and being the bully on the, on the hill instead of the opposite. Pu public school used to just annihilate us. Um, you know, cocky young kid, this isn't happening anymore. We're going we're gonna to take this over. And it took a little bit longer than I wanted, but, you know, in year four, we, we finally – turned the tables and then after that we dominated them. So I went to Mount Aloysius and did the same thing, built their program up and uh, 
you know, I remember the day they hired me, I walked in with the Dean of Students and it's a typical gym, 2000 seat, you know, nice. It's not a arena, it's just a gym. And I just looked at her and again, I'm young. I said, I'm gonna pack this place. And she just looked at me and smiled. My first game, and they were junior college at the time, we're playing Hagerstown, uh, Maryland. They're loaded with, with D1 players and that. <clears throat> and we, we, uh, I got an announcer. I recruited our admissions guy who was fantastic on the mic. And I, I walked by him. I said, congratulations, your debut. I said, there's seven people here and two of them are my family members. <laughs> so, but year four, Fast forward, we're playing Slippery Rock. We got out of JUCO, went NAI, and we had 2,000 people in the gym, and it was packed. And she came up to me and reminded me. She said, you were right. I said, what? I said, you packed this. I said, I told you I was going to. But we did a lot of things with the community and got kids involved in camps and all these things you build up. So, you know, going from Oaks to Mount Aloysius, you know, and then, you know, to these other colleges, you learn some things of how to do that. Uh, so, you know, it, it's fun. Yeah. So what? So the jump from Aloysius to Robert Morris, was that something you've always wanted to do? Was be at the D1 no, level? No, you know what? So I'm in Mount Aloysius and I, I can remember this like it was yesterday. I'm walking to the steps into the gym and they relieved the AD the, that year. And then I came like the interim AD to facilities manager and all that. But they were paying me. And I, I, I said that they're paying me to do this. I would do this for free. I would come here and do what I'm doing for free, you know? So it was not something I did. Coach Jim Boone called me um, all-star, Major League Baseball all-star game at night. Not a relationship with him, with our high school teams when I was back there. And he offered me a job at Robert Morris. And I told my wife, you know, we're newlyweds, new child. I'm like, what do you think? You know, could we, should we try this? Let's see what happens. And she said, she's the one, I blame her. She's the one who pushed me and said, do this, let's go. So we went back there and, you know, we're, we're a Robert Morris with him. We had two great years with them. They left. I stayed back with Danny Nee, who got hired and got to work with a great Hall of Fame coach uh, and Danny Nee at Robert Morris. We were there for a year. Then we went to Duquesne for four years. And, uh, you know, we were on our trajectory up. Um, and in year, it was year, I think it was year, year four, because uh, we kept winning and winning. We had a bad year. We just did a, had a bad decisions in recruiting. And, you know, uh, it was and then year five, uh, or an opportunity to go to West Virginia with John Beeline. And that, that was just phenomenal. It was just a great learning experience and, and a great, you know, great teacher. Yeah, what made John so great? Because obviously he took a couple teams to the Final Four. He's very, very uh, meticulous. I, have, I used to have, when I was at West Virginia, I used to have, you uh, you know, friends of mine, like, man, it must be great. It's like, you know, a wizard or something, you know? And I said, if you understood what we did, you wouldn't do it because it's too easy. And here's a story we're playing. Um, it's we're in the big East, uh, the non-conference getting ready for conference. We have a whole week off and we're playing UConn on Saturday and Wednesday. I swear to you, if you closed your eyes and looked around, you'd say, is this June? We're running camp. And it was like, there was 10 year old kids in here. We had two lines, full length of the court, across from each other, we're passing, chest pass, bounce pass, snap passes. We're working on our pivots, half court, you know, we're working on like, oh my God. You know, it was just his, his love and belief in, in the fundamentals, the easy, simple things that you have to, you, have to, uh, you know, master. And, and that's what made him so great is just all that, but he's a genius you know, offensively, you know, his offense, which we still run, is just, you know, a very, very uh, good rebased offense to learn from. And then he went to Michigan. Did he do the same stuff at Michigan? Same yeah, Michigan? yeah, it was a little tougher. You know, we thought, you know, the Big East was, was, was a great conference and it was a very, you know, tough conference. But that first year at Michigan, it's, it was very physical. It was way more physical. I think the Big East is a little bit more athletic and tough, but these guys were physical. That's why, you know, it's, you know, they're in the fifties, you know, uh, points scored. And it was just a different, you know, uh, animal that we were used to at, at West Virginia. So, but, you know, we adjusted and, uh, you know, turned to turn things around. Yeah. And then from there back to Pennsylvania to St. Francis, what was the, uh, yeah, it was there just getting back home. Uh, you know, you get to that point, it's, you know, it's not the same as it used to be, you know, you, uh, 
you, you love what you do. And you, you know, when I was at Mount Aloysius walking down the steps saying they're paying for me to do this, to now there's all this pressure and all this. And that was one of the things going on there. And we went up West Virginia and I told her, I said, hey, you want to do this? I said, I can do it. The only thing I was worried about was recruitment. How can can I recruit at that level and can do, do that? And, you know, unfortunately, I was very successful. You know, you had um, and it wasn't easy the first year in Michigan. It wasn't easy. You couldn't go get the Plumleys or Zellers out of there and they're going to say, oh, we're coming. You had a lot of work to do to get there. So the first two recruits were two of my kids, Stu Douglas and Zach Novak, that nobody wanted. You know, I mean, uh, nothing against the kids. They just weren't highly recruited kids. And uh, I remember going to the top 100 in uh, Indiana. They have a, uh, every summer they have a, a top 100 camp and I called coach up. I said, coach, you got to get down here. I said, there's a hundred kids we should be looking at because they were all up what we do. They're fundamentally sonic and all shoot. They all understood the game. They may be a step slower or, or couldn't jump or wasn't as athletic. But I, I used to say, let Notre Dame, Indiana, Purdue, you take what you want. The first five or six guys in it, then we're going to get seven, eight, nine. They're going to be great players. Yogi Farrell, you know, was there. But all those kids that we, we recruited, I loved Indiana kids and loved recruiting them. Do you still nowadays with uh, your position, do you still want Indiana kids and fundamentally sound kids based to. on that? Okay. I would love to, but Indiana, you know, what's funny is, you know, the East coast kids all grow up knowing about post-grad and there's uh, parts of the country. They have no clue what it is. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they don't think Indiana is one of those. I look at film and see a kid playing. I'm like, Oh my God, one more year. You're a mid, you're a high major, mid major player, but that's why they all go to, they all go to NEI schools. That's why their NEI schools are really good every year because they're getting Division One players just a year later. Uh, so we're trying to, you know, get some of them. You'll get one or two of them, but the, the top players just don't want to don't want to do it yet. So we're trying to work on it. So you went from St. Francis and then you went all the way south to IMG Academy, which is just yeah. a, a behemoth of a, of a situation, and you're in charge of the post grad team. Yeah, well, when I got there, it wasn't, and that's the thing, you know, my wife and I love the west west side of Florida. We got uh, engaged down at Captive Island, and we spent uh, two weeks honeymooning there, and then we used to vacation there a lot, so she always used to tease me every time we'd move to a different college. She'd say, can you go somewhere a little bit warmer, and, you know, I, you know, so I said, okay, this is a chance to do this, and, you know, it was a great opportunity, but when I got there, the the program wasn't built nationally it was just built you know regionally uh, mostly and you know I, I thought we should take this brand and, and get it out there deserve to be out nationally and you know when I started I had 15 kids from last that were at last year's team when the time I left I had 35 kids and obviously a lot more money uh, but uh, we built the program up we did a great job it was a great place to work uh, there's so many great learning experiences there you I learned more from other other coaches or other coaches from other programs uh right outside our gym was the tennis and I'd go out there and stand and watch the tennis people and you see a, a person work on their forehand and there's five people standing behind them. well in basketball if someone's doing their shot the other guy's just standing in line waiting well all those kids are still working on their forehand without hitting the ball so they're going to do that. So the person in front's going to hit two or three uh, forehand shots while they're mimicking her movements the whole time. So by the time that person gets up, they did it 10, 12 times. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to hit the ball three times. Then they're going to go back. So I've implemented those things in our practices in uh, some of the footwork, some of the, uh, our post-transfer drills. We have a line or in our offense, we come up and get it and transfer it over. So when by the time they've got, got up to the front, they've done it, the footwork five times because it's really hard to get. So if you only did it once, it's going to take longer. So that, those are some of the things we I learned from other coaches uh, that were some great teachers there. Yeah, and was Brian Nash, is that the connection, how you got down there? No, I was there before Brian. Okay. Um, uh, Kenny Nat actually was the director there, and, and uh, you know, I just applied and got the job I don't know. well Luckily, brian was yeah. duquesne right and you were duquesne he so. was a duquesne at the time okay. yeah then he came uh, when i was there yeah we were, yeah we were together for a little bit and for those yeah. that don't know brian nash is the uh um, what director of operations for the basketball team there yeah he's the director of basketball every sport has a director so it'd be kind of like every um athletic director of every sport yeah that's what he kind of does so i asked this of a lot of prep school coaches john and you you had the privilege to coach some nba players 
during your time at IMG. Um, tell me who those guys were and tell me what made them NBA players versus non-NBA players. Well, obviously talent. You've got to be talented. You've got to be skilled. And, you know, because I've had a couple kids that are, you know, everyone says, oh, you got to work hard. And I've got some kids that will outwork these guys sometimes. They just are just relentless. They're just not good. They're just not talented. But there's a, there's a mindset that you have to have. I think that uh, that these guys had, you know, the Jonathan Isaacs and, you know, uh, uh, Anthony Simons and those guys that just were just a little bit uh, different. And they, they, they worked harder. They did the, they did something really, really good. And, you know, that was their strength. Um, and uh, so but it's it's has to be you have to be talented. You have to be skilled. You have to you know, you can't be five uh, ten and be lights out shooter. And you have to be great at something you do. Uh, and you have to be uh, a little bit more skilled than somebody else uh, and talented. But I don't, Mike James was a, a player for us at Duquesne. It wasn't for us. He was before our time. And when we got to Duquesne, uh, the, we would talk, talk to the maintenance guys. And they would say on a Friday night at 11 o'clock, you hear the ball bouncing and you'd go in a gym and you would see Mike James in there on a Friday night or a Saturday night. And instead of being out, you know, having fun, you know, just relaxing, he was working and he made himself. He was a, a good player, you know, in, in, uh, in Duquesne, but he became a great player and, you know, won a championship with Miami and then got that, that big guarantee contract in Toronto. And, and uh, he told me once, I said, what, what do you do? How do you do this? How do you get it? He said, you have to have animal. Mm -hmm. I said, animal. He said, yes. He said, coach, they're trying to take my job. Think about that. Go to work every day and somebody's trying to steal from you and take your job away from you. How are you going to fight for your family and your house and your kids? What are you going to do? He said, on my team, there's a guy, he's trying to take my job. And when I'm playing against my opponent, he's trying to take my job. He's trying to beat me. He's trying to take something from me. He said, so I always had it in my head about telling kids, see if they have that animal in them. You have to have, there's something different about them, those kids that you have to have that it thing. You know, people talk about it. Well, that it is that animal. I got to go out there and this is business. This is, you know, they're trying to steal, take my car, my wife, my, my house and put me out and make me homeless. And they're not going to do it. You know, so that was his, his way of, um, communicating that to us. I thought it was great. Oh, I love that. I love that. Another thing is sickness. I've heard that uh, from Joe Mantegna at Blair Academy. You're possessed. You're possessed yeah. with it. And it's just, that's all you want, you know. Um, but yeah, there's just kids out there that, that, that you can tell. You know, I recruited Gordon Hayward. I never thought Gordon Hayward would be a pro. Never thought he would be a pro though. There's so many guys, you know, that we that I recruited and we didn't get that I would... Kawhi Leonard, I got an opportunity to recruit Kawhi Leonard. I never thought he'd be this good. Never, ever in high school, you know. Uh, now, Clay Thompson, we recruited Clay. I thought we, we thought he was special. And, and, you know, we called him a point forward back in 2006 or whatever it was, a point forward. He could play all four positions for us. You know, it was, uh, it was fun recruiting Clay. It was, uh, he was different, very different. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. All right, now let's go to your current uh, position at 212 Academy. So tell me a little yes. bit about, about why you started this and a little bit about the program. Oh, you always want to do things. For, I, I like challenges building. 200, 212 degrees is our 212 academy. degrees, sorry. Yeah, sorry. that's okay. Everyone does 212. It's better than 212 or whatever, but here's the thing. So, you know, everyone knows the spiel about 211, water's hot, and one more degree, water boils. Enough boiling water will produce steam. Enough steam can move a car, a locomotive. So we implement into our guys, you know, our staff, everyone around us knows this is what we do. So if you just give it one little extra degree, whatever it is on a court that you do, you can raise your game up, all right? Not only on the court, off the court, please. Thank you, holding the door, smiling. Just one little thing, just one little thing. So that's what our whole, 212 degrees at one little extra effort, one little extra kindness, one little, you know, just it doesn't take much to do. And you can be a special person and a special player. So, you know, doing it my way, the way I want to do it, how I want to do it, how, you know, we're in for the culture of our kids, um, the facility that we use, all the people there know what this is. You know, uh, they've supported us. They've, uh, in one year alone, we've built a, a community 
of people. You know, I just was down here the other day and they're asking about the new kids coming and, you know, want to be involved more. Can we do this? And I'm like, absolutely. You know, so that's, that's the genesis of it. You have your own, you can do what you want, how you want to do it. Um, I can take care of a kid. We like to take care of one kid a year. It doesn't matter what talent it is, but one year kid a year who can't afford it. We're going to let him come and we're going to change his life. And we're going to get him a college degree, a scholarship, get him into a school or whatever. But that, that's why I do it. It's not about, you know, admissions numbers or, well, you, you know, it's going to cost. We can't do this. You can't. No, I can do whatever I want. And this is what we want to do. So we, we, don't, we had one last year. We had one this year coming and we're excited about it. And, you know, um, you know, just try to change somebody's life. Oh, that's great. That's great. So based on this, we talked about this ahead of time. We're going to get into now the post-grad basketball world. So, you know, I've been very vocal on letting people know that there's two avenues of post-grad. There's prep schools, which are places that are full schools. They have administrations. They've been around a while. Uh, they've got non-basketball players there. And then you've got your basketball academies, which are strictly normally just basketball. Sometimes they have school. Sometimes it's online. Sometimes it's associated with a Christian school or whatever. And they're two different animals. And a lot of times people just call them prep school, right? But there are a difference. I've been telling people that all along. And you now have been in the real prep school world with IMG and that whole animal there. And now you're starting your own. And unfortunately, you have other basketball academies out there that you get lumped into that are not doing it the right way, right? Yeah. Talk yeah. to me about yeah. like your, your, your peers out there and, and um, what families need to look out for when looking in the basketball academy world? Like, give me some of your advice for a family. Well, you have to do your homework. And, you know, they're fortunate enough to have people like you out there helping, you know, your, your business is helping people, you know, find places to go that are going to be doing it the right way. We do it the right way, you know, by the way we treat our people, uh, you know, being honest, being upfront, uh, not selling something there is you know, I want to make money. Don't get me wrong, but we're not in it for the money. You know, we don't have it. I didn't take a paycheck last year. We wanted to get this going. Um, but, you know, making sure you're doing it right with the NCAA. You're not doing something that is illegal with them or, you know, um, I run our program like my mentality and I tell our kids, I'm at Michigan right now and this is how we're running it. We're not going to play 50 games a year and that's fine. Some programs want to do that and they want to sell it. That's, that's great. I don't. We're going to start November 1st, just like college does. We're going to play 30 some games, just like college does, you know, um, you know, so we, we try to emulate a college year because that's what we are getting you ready for. I call it an etch a sketch year. That's and then I have to explain to the kids what an etch a sketch is and it kind of takes the whole thing out of it. You can mess up and we can tell you what happened. So you don't do this again next year. You know, our whole goal in this whole thing is when they leave us and they go to college they're ahead of the freshmen there and they're more prepared and i think college coaches understand what i do where i've come from and they know that you know if you're gonna get a kid from coach mahoney he's gonna be ready he's gonna be you know uh, more prepared i have two two examples of that kenny smith's son played for us and kj calls me up one day and kj's like a 10 year old on christmas morning telling me everything he got for christmas he's just blah, 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 just talking away man he's going nuts I'm like, dude, what's up? What, what are you getting at? What do you want? He said, coach, he goes, you're right. He goes, I'm so much further ahead than these guys. They have no clue. He said, I'm the only one in the gym after practice shooting, you know, because you're going to get shots. You think you're getting them in practice. You're not. Your shots are going to be after practice. You better make your two to 500 shots after practice. Grab a manager, you know, so he was so excited. And then on the other hand, I had Eric Ayala, who goes to Maryland. And Eric was great for us. He played well. He was very respectful, you know, was on time, but he didn't ever give that extra effort. He didn't get that extra. And I don't want to say effort. I don't want to say that. I would try to tell him. And he goes, I got you, coach. I got you. But when he got there, I'm in Vegas. I land, go in to get my car. I look, I see his number. And I'm like, what's up? And he said, coach, this is Eric. I said, I know who it is. What's up, Eric? And he said, I have to apologize. I said, for what would you do? He said, you were right. I said, what do you mean? He said, coach, everything you told me, they're telling me now. Everything you did with us, they were doing now. I said, all right, I told you that. He said, but I didn't listen. I didn't, I didn't. And I'm mad at myself because I would be further ahead than I was. Mm. I said, I understand, Eric. I said, that's good. I said, just, you know, so that's one of our testimonies. We show our kids that Eric writes this back. Listen, 
because it'll help you. And, you know, and I tell people, you can get anything you want out of this. We're going to, we, we know, we have the answers to the test. We know what, I've been there. I know what they're looking for. I know what's going to make you look good. I know what's going to uh, prepare you mentally and physically to get to that next spot. So if you don't buy into it, I can't help you. You have to trust us. And one of the things in our program, and I learned a lot of stuff at IMG, a lot of good stuff, because you don't know how to do this. And when you go from college to there, it's a different animal. And, you know, I remember my first year there, you're, you're like, no, this is wrong. We got to do this. After the year there, you go, whoa, this is, this is a different animal. And so I learned a lot. And one of the things is develop a relationship. So once a kid uh, 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 commits to us and they pay their deposit, we commit to them. All right. So I may not be able to be there, but I'm, we're gonna, I'm going to give them workouts I want them to do. I need somebody to FaceTime you. So I'm going to watch you at two o'clock. You're going to be in a gym and then I can bring them over. All right. Hey, I want you to do that. So it's kind of a long distance coaching one-on-one -on -one session with them. We're going to start our recruitment now. I'm not going to, I can't wait till you get here in September. And that was one of the things, you know, so we sell that. I'm, I'm working with you now. Each kid gets their own website. All right. We make the website. We put it up for you. And then you have access to add stuff to it. Your, your highlights or, or your, if you, some of our kids are in summer, summer, um, uh, AAU. So we're going to put that on. So we send it out to the coach as soon as we can. As soon as you come in, I'm getting it out. You know, so I think starting that communication, I want a kid to come to me in September and we're, we're, we're comfortable with each other. We know each other, you know, and I don't want to wait, you know, uh, down the road. Aline Ford was a perfect example. He and I butted heads until December and until he finally just said, all right, you know, I'm going to trust you. And then, you know, he, he turned out to be good, but you, you have to trust us because we're telling you sometimes a lot of things that, that you're not used to hearing. You know, I, I tell you what you need to hear. I don't tell you what you want to hear. I don't babysit nobody. I'm harder on my better players than our, you know, John Isaac's been kicked out of practice. You know, Chris McCullough had to do tile pushes, you know, and because you just show the other kids, I, I don't need a job. I'm not asking for money. You know, I always tell my players, you know, you know, told Jonathan, all I want you to do is get me tickets to the game. I just want to come watch you play in the pro. That's it. I don't want nothing from you. Because everybody, you got to figure, those kids, those high school kids, everybody's grabbing at them. Everyone's touching them. Hey, can I have this? Can I have that? You know, he went up to a, a, a Tampa one day, and he's on his Twitter. He has his shirt on promoting this guy's company. So he comes back. I said, do you know that guy? He goes, no. I said, do you know he owns you now? He has you all over his website. And he's like, Really? I said, yes. Call him up, tell him, take it down, and don't wear the shirt again. He's making money off you, man, because you you said you promoted his stuff if you're just by wearing his shirt. So kids don't know that. You know, it's just really a, an educational uh, moment for him. So, you know, I don't know where I get off topic, I think, Corey. I'm sorry. Well, so if, if I'm understanding this correctly, your pitch to a kid is, hey, I'm a former college coach. I've been at IMG Academy. I've coached pros. You're going to come here, and I know – the formula to get you prepared for the next year, whether you listen or not, I know the formula. We're going to start the recruitment immediately once you sign up. And then we know the steps to take. And then we have a track. Record. Right. But yeah, it's the, the trust the factor. Thing, the trust I have, factor I, I, you know, I have, and there's a couple other guys that, that, that are in the same boat, but I've been on both sides. I know what, what, what the college coaches want, but I also been on the postgrad side. So I learned, all that I've been there for eight years. This is going on our tenth year of doing a postgrad, so I know both both angles, and I know how to make them both work. So, you know, it's uh, uh, I think it's unique, but the trust factor is just the key, man. You got to trust. You know, we uh, you know, so we do a lot of that with our kids, talking to kids, texting them. You know, um, you just they're they're all they're all different, and they all have different needs and different wants, and there's different ways. I got to find out how I can push them. Every kid has another level. I don't care how bad they are. They have another level in them. How can we get that as a staff? You know, do I get to love him? Do I get to yell at him? Do I get to, you know, talk to him, show him with a video? What, I, I got to figure that out in these three or four months before they get here, you know, because that's the whole thing. How are we going to do this uh, to be successful? You know, if we produce, not wins, if we produce good players who go on, that's what's going to sell our program. You know, and I think a lot of these programs that, that we were talking about out there, there's the, um, you know, the pop-up ones and all that. They're, 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 I think I would say 90% worry about winning. And don't get me wrong. I want to win. I'm more competitive. 
but after the game, it's teaching. You know, once I get over that competitiveness, it's about the teaching moment and what can we do? And, you know, we give our kids a lot of homework after games. I mean, you know, they, you know, I think they thought they were just going to be like high school, but no, it's like, all right, I need you to do this. And I give them a whole list of things and they're like <laughs> watching the film. I watched it. I watched the film three times. I watch it once and I go back, take notes. I go back again and take notes again. So, cause I can't see everybody at one time through. I gotta, if I'm watching you, then I'm going to watch this the second set. Eight. Teaching them how to watch film and create, create uh, critique themselves. I had a kid this year. I said, give me your evaluation after watching the film. So he gave me all this stuff. I said, I said, all right, here's mine. And it was totally opposite. And he was like, wow. He said, I didn't see it. I said, we brought him in and watched the film together. I said, do you see what I'm seeing? So I want you to see what a coach sees, yeah. not what you and mom and dad see. Do you see what I'm saying? I got you. I said, yes. You know, I had a kid at 25 points. He thought I ripped him in a film session. I said, you stunk. You know, look, and I'm showing him clips of him jogging back on defense, not in help position, all this stuff. And he's like, but I had 20. He said, yeah, but you gave up like 35 points. You didn't make anyone else better. You didn't do anything else to help your team. It was about you, you know? So get that where you, you know, you can, you can do that. Uh, I think just having an understanding of all that, where, where it is, but a lot of these guys, they want to win and you got to win. I understand that. I got to win because no one's going to come to a program that loses all the time. You know, so you have to have a balance uh, of that uh, too. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all that. I think that's an important question for families and kids to ask when they are talking to any, any postgrad or prep school coach or academy coach is, you know, why are you doing this? Right. And I've talked to guys, they've told me point blank, Oh, I'm trying to get an NBA player so I can get, get mine. Or, Hey, I'm trying to use this to get a shoe deal. Or I'm trying to do this to get a, a college coaching job. Like they they tell me things that they aren't going to tell families, but families need to ask that to know, why are these people yeah. in it, right? I had, I had somebody ask me, do we have a shoe deal? I said, no, I got no shoe deal. I don't care about no shoe deal. You'll have shoes. We'll, we'll take care of that. Don't worry about it. I'll have a shoe deal. But, you know, it's just, I think once you get to know people you, and talk to them, I think you can get the, how, uh, you know, genuine they are. Are they really, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm recruiting kids just like I would have as I was at Michigan. I'm constantly texting, calling, talking, Zoom. What do you got to do, you know? Because you have to develop a relationship and they got to know you care. If you don't care, do I care about your money? Do I care about you? You know, and yeah. I really, I said, you know, and I told it, I tell, I tell people all the time, if this is a monetary decision, I'm sorry, I can't help you out. I have, I know what I need to pay the bills and to have the program I want to run to be at a level I want it to run, it's it. It's not because, oh, you're more expensive. Yes, because do you, and now I'll do this. What do you want me to cut out then? You want to pay what? You want to pay X amount? Okay, so what can I cut out of this for your son? Food, housing, training, travel? What do you want? What do you want? It's like buying a car. Do you want the, do you want the floor mats? No, okay, we'll take it out. We'll make it cheaper. So, you know, this is, I'm giving you all this for a reason. You tell me if you can't, that's fine. I've turned people away because they weren't fits this year. They could pay. It just wasn't going to be um, right for us. It wasn't. And, you know, my son's helping us. He played at Florida Gulf Coast. So he's trying to get into this. He said, you're not coaching college. You're going to do this. I'm going to be done someday. You can have it. And we're going to have it all built up. And uh, But he said, well, what happened? I said, he just wasn't a fit. He's not going to be able to learn. He doesn't have a growth mindset. The kid knows it all already. He thinks he's better than what he is, and he, I, I'm not going to fight him on it. It's just, you know, it's not a fit for us. It's, it's okay. You know, we'll get, we'll get somebody else. So the other thing we do, Corey, and I think it's important this year. There's a tremendous amount of kids out there. Yeah. Tremendous. There's what oh, I think a little under 600 in the transfer portal that haven't been placed yet. That still are out there. You got a million high school kids that are just hanging on for this live period, and I'm begging them to please. You don't have to come to me. Put, you, put 2022 on your thing because no one's looking at 21s. And then you got the postgrads, which a lot of us in the postgrad business thought when the NCAA said the freshmen, everyone got that year. We thought they meant them too. They didn't mean them. They're stuck. So I've been on calls with the NCAA and, and don't get it. Uh, I, I, you know, they showed me the graph they gave me. I still don't get it. Um, but I said, you're going to have a lot of people. And at the, for the people out there, the basic thing is, if they do another postgrad year, the school they go to has got to get a waiver, and they'll probably 
that's going to probably happen. But just think about all the kids that are out there from post-grad, high school, uh, overseas, all these kids that are out there in the, in the portal that aren't going to have a place to go. It's, so what, we, what I've done and my, my staff is, if we have two teams, because you, you can get to that point, position um, oriented team. I, I can't have, you know, and I'm not bad about the 9G. One year I had 12, 5, 10 guards. Yeah. You know? <laughs> what am I going to do with this? So we have five guards for two teams. As soon as I get the point guard, I, I, I hit a kid yesterday. I said, I'm not pressuring you. I'm letting you know I have one spot left. And I have a contract out to a person. So you had that contract and that's fine because he's trying to get a, a spot this year. I said, I understand that. And, uh, but I'm just letting you know, then we move. Once we get all those spots, we're done, you know? So we're not going to overload one spot because I can't place the kids. I can't get them on a floor. I can't get them ample time on a court. You know, it's not fair to anybody else. And, you know, so that's, that's what we're doing. And I don't know if they think that you're online or whatever, but I, I just can't, it's not fair. I got to see the kids every day and they're going to say, wait, you said you had five, we had seven, you know? Well, they were paying 28, 30,000. Why not? You know, no, we're not doing it. Tell me what the advantages are of a basketball academy versus a brick and mortar prep school. Um, you know, because again, I think it's up to the family. I've had families, you know, at IMG, you don't have to go to school, you know, as a post-grad. You, we have PG college kids. Uh, kids that elected to take college classes um, at uh, South Florida. We had PG high school kids. A lot of the foreign kids have to be in high school and no, uh, no sport. Kids, you know, so, you know, last year when I had uh, 30 some kids, I probably had, you know, 12 or 14 didn't take any classes. They just were PG sport only. And then you had some taking PG college and then you had some taking, you know, there. So I've had parents say, He's a 4-0. He doesn't need any academics. And you can't take any more academics. He has high enough grades. He can't take any more college classes because he already has college credits, you know, the, the ones that he needs. He's 176 eight. He needs weight. He needs to get in the weight room. He needs to eat right. He needs training. So I think that if you have the proper strength coach and uh, nutritionist and all that that we do, then you can help them that way. You know, I've had, you know, and, I, and the New England schools are awesome. Don't get me wrong, but I've had kids later on that are college kids say, I didn't need to go to school because I was a great student, but I had to go to school. And I don't know if it's a, I don't think we're wrong because I, I do what the NCAA tells me to do. Our kids have classes. We're affiliated with a, a brick and mortar school with real people. Um, 212 is having high school at Elevation Prep this year. So we branched out, we moved on and uh, we were having high school. So our kids are you know, uh, full-fledged affiliated, SAT, ACT prep class, uh, ESL classes, but they can also take something there because um, they can repeat one class if they haven't, uh, don't have the IEP and they can do that there too. Um, so we have academic advisors to work with and all that, but the, the advantage, I think it's up to the parents and the kids. You know, and I've had parents that, that are with us now is, what are we doing? I want them to do academics. And I, what I do is we can do the academics, but we do college credits. If I have a 3.0 student and all that, we'll work with a, a junior college here. And I say, I can do that for you. It's going to cost you more because you're out of sure. state. It's going to cost you more out of state. So do this. Look at what it's going to cost you in your state at a community college. Take an English 101 history or, or math 101. Do it here. We have time slots in our schedule that they got to bring their laptop, report to there, and go to class, and it's monitored. I said, if not, we can do the same thing here. We'll take you to the school for that class. You know, we, we, we have buses that take you there, but it's going to cost you whatever you want. We can do whatever way you want to do it. But we still, in, you know, implement that, that part of it. I think, it's, I think it's important. I tell all my kids, take a class. If you're, if you're not going to do it with us, take a class, just you keep that rhythm. It's a true um, college day. You get up, you have your, your, your skill session, your weights, class, lunch, class, practice, you know, um, you know, a pool rehab or whatever it is, um, uh, meetings or whatever it is. And it's, you know, now it's seven o'clock. So, so it seems to me, 
Yeah, so it seems to me the advantage of, of an academy would be more, more, a lot more personalized to where right, a yeah. lot of prep schools, yeah, yeah. you got to you have it or you don't. Exactly. That's yes. Yeah. Yeah. A la carte. Uh, yeah. And we do. We have some kids do it and some kids don't. Uh, you know, we, you know, I'm trying to think, uh, we're like a Northfield Mount Herman a little bit. John Carroll does a great job, a great coach, but all his kids are smart. And, you know, I looked at our, our rosters. I'm like, Dude, I just told my staff, I said, we have no one under a 3-2. <laughs> you know, everybody has great grades, you know, so it's good. And I think it helps. You have self-motivated people that way and that are determined to, to, you know, conscious about their schooling and all that stuff. So, you know, it hasn't had anyone there, but we can take someone who needs extra help. We can, you know, I have a kid who has an IEP. He can go to school and get those three classes because we have it right there. You know, so, you know, it's, it, it, it's been good. Now you last year having your first year, um, you played against some of these other pop up academies that probably weren't as reputable. So what can families look for? Like you know, you have to name, obviously you're not going to name any names, but like what should they look for? Ask with some places. It's it, it's it's hard. You know, or where you know where are they living? Um, uh, how long they've been doing it? Who's been there? Can you talk to people? Can you talk to families? And then they had need to remember, talk to the fans, but ask them questions. Yeah, you know, I always tell my parents, I said, you tell me what you want. I'll get you somebody who lives in your area. You know, I had a family I was recruiting a kid from New Jersey. I got her uh, two, I gave her three, three parents to call. I said, call these three parents all in the New York, uh, Philly, Jersey area. And I didn't know the one lady from New York said, coach, I've been talking to this mom for two weeks now, <laughs> back and forth. I'm like, oh, great. But, you know, I have nothing to hide with none of my kids or none of my parents, um, you know, because I've been honest and I've never lied. I never embellished. I never said anything. You know, it's even the recruiting part. I get every kid's a division one player. And I learned that before at IG. I'm not telling you no, because I've had kids come in, not division one, and they end up being a division one. We talk about fit. And that's the whole thing. You know, hey, I hear what you're saying. I said, but let's talk about who's recruiting you now. Mm-hmm. Who's called you on the phone? Nobody? Okay, so we have to make you an attractive person. We've got to get a D3 spot for you. Then you can move up to the D2s. If I say D2 guy, hey, I got this kid. Who's recruiting? Nobody. All right. But if, I, if there's a bug, we, we say, let's, we have to create a buzz. we got to create a buzz about you, some excitement around you, some interest around you. And that's how we work up from the bottom up, because if not, you're going to be stuck and not have a place to go. If we choose to just try to get to division one, when you have nothing. Right. So those, I, would, I would talk about the parents that, you know, who do they have before, you know, I, I, you know, okay, I'm new. Our program's new. I understand it, but I, where was I before and how I've done it before? Um, I think is a big question that they, they should ask uh, them. There's some good ones, but there, there's, the, the, there's a lot of places I played last year only because I had to with the pandemic. There ain't no way they're calling me. I'm like, no, I'm not. I got guys coming late, you know. You know, it's just, it's just not right. You know, we played a team one time. The kids were there. The coach didn't show up till after tip. <laughs> like, God, you know, it's it's crazy. The details, it's, right? We're really good. We beat them. All, but, you know, it's just running it the right way, how we do it. You know, uh, my biggest fears in our program are they staying in a, in a great place? Uh, safe place. Uh, we won't put more kids in there. You know, I had a, I had a, a person say, you know, uh, by law, you can put eight kids in an apartment. I said, that's not my law. It's two bedroom, two bath. We're going to put four kids in there, two in each bedroom, two kids got their own bathroom, each have their own closets, living room, dining room, kitchen. I said, I'm not doing it. I, 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 I'm not going to do that. It's not right. And that's what a lot of the kids said, coach, you know, you hear stories about this. And he goes, he goes, I was really shocked. We really had, you know, what we had, you know, my, again, my fear is those things are we eating or we're right. You know, we don't have a cafeteria right now. We do at the school. So that's something we're working out because we're five miles away, the postgrad where we're staying to where they're at. But my fear is, are we eating enough? Mm-hmm. And I would constantly, you know, when they get there and Corey, uh, we have three phases of our program. And the, the first phase is the evaluation phase. We evaluate every kid and we take that all and we have a template we fill out and then we go through it with them. And after that third week, they're there. I'll ask them, how's your roommate? How's your apartment? How's the food? Anything I need to change? Do you need more of this or that? 
right? That, you know, let me know. I don't want you calling mom or dad. You tell me now I, I need more of this or I, can I have more of that? And this year, no one, no one ever complained about one thing. And then we do exit interviews with them, you know, so you're leaving. All right, let's sit down and talk. How was your part, coach? I, Aki Anderson goes, coach, that was the best. He said, I love my apartment. I said, yeah, you're, these kids are 18, 19 years old. They're living in an apartment, you know. Uh, they're, they're, they're adult. They're trying to be, you know, mature, you know. I said, I didn't like the cleaning part of it. I said, but I think I'll be better for it. You know, every Sunday is a cleaning day. And you have a different chore on Sunday, you know. Um, but th those are my big things. And then we do, I call them. 30-second uh, timeout meeting. So, so I'll just grab a kid, you know, just a quick one. Uh, the next month later, hey, how's everything going? How's your food? How's your, you know, is there any problem? You can't, you can't assume. Kids get quiet on you. And they're not going to say nothing. It could be, I'm not playing well enough. I'm not this. And you can sense it. So you try to hit everything off, by you, but you have to keep in touch with them. And then we have bigger meetings, you know, recruiting meetings about it, because that's the biggest thing. And you try to get these things. But again, what's that go back to? Communication. You got to keep talking to them and and keep on them and, you know, uh, you know, try to keep that dialogue. Some kids won't talk. Some kids will be very vocal and talk to you and, and you know, come out and say, hey, you know, I'm not playing as much as I thought. All right, well, let's talk about it, you know, but other kids won't. So just yeah. being up on it. But those are, those are my fears, you know. I know when we're going to get them on a court, uh, you know, and another kid say, I said, you know, is that an exit area? He goes, those six o'clock workouts, though. I said, no, okay. <laughs> I know we're not perfect, but tell your college coach next year <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're actually gonna have those 6 a.m workouts so that's yeah. Yeah. yeah let me ask you this uh being a former d1 guy um let's say we have two players that are exact the exact same player same grade same stats same uh bona fides one goes to a brick and mortar prep school one goes to um a basketball academy do d1 coaches stereotypically care which route they come out of post-grad if it's the same player or is there um, I don't think so. Don't I don't think, think so. If it's, if it's, I think, I really think, and I would, if I was at West Virginia, Michigan or Duquesne recruit, who's who from the non brick and mortar school, you were saying the Academy, who's, who's his coach, you know, is he a shyster? Is he, you know, someone who just does things, you know, the wrong way. And it's like, cause I, I want a kid that's going to, you know, have the values that we want to have. Is he, was he in a program that has those same values? But I, I think they'll find you wherever if it, they don't, you know, I've seen some kids that we played this year that got a scholar. I'm like, wow, I would have never thought he would, he would be able to get that. So I don't think some coaches are different though. They, they don't care sometimes. So yeah. I think it's who, you know, and um, the connections you have with the college coaches too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It, last thing on the, the prep school versus post-grad or post-grad world. Is there anything you want to mention about it that, we haven't talked about that might need to have some light on it or that no one uh, discusses ever. Or there's a misconception. Yeah. I, I mean, there's just, and I, and I don't, I, I, I don't try to get into it with, with parents. And, you know, I, I was shocked that a lot of it's money, you know, to parents, you know, this is your one shot. You better make it right. And I'm, I'm not charging it $80,000 or $70,000. You know, I know what it costs us and I can break it down what it's costing us and all that. But, you know, a lot of parents, it's, it's money. You know, well, I got it for, for nine grand. I said, think about that. How, how much is it going to cost you to feed your son for those seven, eight months and house him for seven, eight months? And you're not even traveling the games. Of it. It's more than that. You know, so you got to be, be aware of you pay for what you get, get what you pay for, um, you know, um, did they have a lot of games where that were canceled last year? And again, it's hard because of COVID, you know, but, you know, I, I've had coaches cancel games, homie. They, like, you know, they make us look bad, but I'm not going to play them next year. And that uh, just being, you know, this is one shot. I would just make sure you do it right. And if it's not us, I, I tell parents all the time, if you don't want to come with us, that's fine. I will help you though. Find a spot that maybe you, you can, you know, they can better afford you in the area. I don't want to send them all the way forward. Great. All right. Well, you're up here. Try these two places. These guys do a good job. They're on top of their kids, you know, uh, you know, something like that, but just got to be, be careful. Um, you know? Yeah. One thing I don't like, I, I, I saw one, I thought, I, I, I think we spoke, I thought it was a Legion airlines because 
it was a la carte. You could, uh, yeah. do you want food or it's costing you this? Do you want extra training? It's this. You want uh, film? It's this. You want, <laughs> it was like, holy crap. <laughs> and then by the time it was all over, it was what we're charging. I'm like, it's the same thing. You know? The pet peeve of mine, John, is where like, you know, the, pre- the academy is going to cost 15K, right? But they'll send the parents a contract that says 50K. Plus, we're giving you a $20,000 scholarship. We're giving you a grant for this. So it's getting down to 15K, but they make it look like it costs 50K. We, we do that. It sells. We it's just like a car, uh, the, the sticker price on a car. And I always tell them, here's the sticker. Because no matter if I put 15K, the parent's going to want to go 10 or 9 because they, they all want to get a deal. They all want to see that they get a break in it. Sure. And we have, we have you know, all right, are you academics? You get uh, money for academics, money for a positional player wings six, six six and above um uh, if you're on an eybl team you know we give money for that so there's different ways we give money then they feel that they they've gotten something for you know what what they been just saying oh yeah well i, I know one that charges 48 and it's a uh, it's like that and it's they're always they're way under us <laughs> yeah exactly that's what i'm talking about right there is where it's a it's yeah, just it's just, just crazy smoke and mirrors you know, almost. put it down a little bit but you know, we do that. We don't ever get the 38. I think we charge that's with the fees and that, but um, we've gotten close a couple times to, to that to some kids. And, you know, but it's just, yeah, they, yeah, I said you need that window with that because people want that, they want that break. Yeah, I know. You know? All right, we're going to finish up a lightning round here, John. What was your biggest win ever as a coach? Now, see, I got this, and I, I this isn't going to be lightning. It's like a storm. All right, so every place I've been almost, I've had it. Like when I first started coaching in high school, we beat a team called Manesson in the semis and to go to the WPL finals. But the quarterfinals, their team watched our team play. And you got to understand, I had a, a milky white slow team and they were ultra quick and they were laughing and giggling laughs. We ended up beating them by 12 in the semifinals and that. So that was kind of where we, we turned that program around. Um, Hargrave, and when I was at uh, my first year as a post-grad coach at, uh, at IMG, we played in the, in the quarterfinals of uh, Fink's uh, tournament. We're down 15, a minute, minute and 20 left. Eric Cooper scores 14, um, 14 points in 12, a minute and 10, because he hits a three, we call it, and I never, never press. Anyway, we send it into overtime. And he's this far because his last three is on the line. And I, as soon as he shot, I looked at his foot. It was on the line. The refs, he goes down and blocks the shot to send it overtime. The refs screaming at me like I was arguing. I said, I'm not arguing. I saw it. But we end up beating them in overtime. And, you, you know, um, um, their teams are tough. They were just tough and physical. And, you know, that was a big win for us. Uh, at Michigan, when we beat uh, – well, West Virginia, too. We beat UCLA at UCLA. They're ranked second, uh, and then but Michigan when we beat um, UCLA our second year in the Garden, um, again uh, it was a, it was a big win for we were young they were veteran veteran team so those were our biggest ones. Cool. How about the best player you've ever coached against? There was there's there's too many. There's not one. I mean you know when you're in the Big East you got uh, back then you had Nardi and Foy and uh, you know even at Duquesne you had Romain Sato. I mean, some great players, maybe didn't play in the NBA, Draymond Green, you mm. know, at Michigan State. I mean, we had some, you know, you're always playing against Rudy Gay, I think was there, uh, Aldridge in Texas when we played them a couple times. You know, there's just so many players. Uh, to pick one isn't, isn't fair. Okay. Uh, how about uh, what do you do hobby-wise when you're not coaching? Uh, I ride my road. I got a road bike. You know, so I get uh, try to get 20 miles a week. You know, down here is it, it benefits you to live in a great place where you can ride, run. I used to run, now my knees won't let me, so I, I ride a lot. Put the tights and the helmet on and go out there. Done a couple 60 milers. Um, so there's a race across Florida that they have every year, and I'm trying to do that. Okay. I did a, I did a um, uh, an Ironman once down here. You uh, did a full Ironman. Yeah, no, no, not Ironman was the um, triathlon. Triathlon. Oh, yeah. Ironman's a whole another animal there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're about to have a whole new podcast. 
<laughs> yeah, triathlon. Uh, so you, you, there's a lot of things that keep you active and keep you moving down here. So, but biking, you know, just get on and go. We're, I'm right near the island, so I can go right up and down the island, come back, get, get your 20 miles in, and clear your head, and make you feel good. Oh, perfect. Man, what's your favorite movie of all time? Oh, Shawshank Redemption. I bet if we turn on the TV right now, it's on. What do you think? Is it? Probably. It's always on. I said, if you turn on the TV, it seems like Shawshank is always on some But you know what? It's one of those movies when it comes on, I got to stop. Yeah. And I got to watch it for some reason. You know, some good movies I like and I really like, but I can't watch it again. I'm not in the mood. I'm always in the mood to watch it. Um, But it was, uh, it's, it's one of my favorites. Oh, that's great. Well, John, where can people find you online? We're at 212. Um, uh, on Twitter, 212 Sports, and uh, Instagram, same thing, 212 Sports, and uh, our website is uh, 212sports.com. Perfect. Come well, check John, us out, man. Yeah, check it out. Well, thanks so much for getting on today and sharing uh, your experiences, and you know, really, um, you're the first guy to come on that's had experience in the post-grad uh, basketball academy world, so I think this was a valuable conversation for a lot of people uh to listen there, to there, there there are some good people out there absolutely yeah, to do it and they're not and i mean and i know we're up against uh but we just got to rely on our reputation and i you know, tell my staff just keep doing it right keep be, you know be honest and keep being up front and you know we'll be all right yeah perfect so again this is a prep athletics podcast coach john mahoney joined us today if you guys want to stay uh, up to date and uh, not miss an episode, go ahead and subscribe on all major podcasting platforms or YouTube, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much.